Good morning, Breakfast Club viewers. <laughs> this is episode 49, and we are joined today by Kendall Calhoun, PhD candidate in UC Berkeley's Brad Shares Lab in the Department of Environmental Science, Policy, and Management. Hi, Kendall. Thanks so much for being here. Hi, thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, happy to. And you are, I have to say, you had the distinction of being the only Breakfast Club guest who has ever stood me up for a pretest because you had to go call her a coyote. <laughs> okay, I'm very last minute. I'm very sorry for that. Yeah, it was, to make it worse, you, know. you didn't even get it, did you? No, we did. We did. Oh, you did. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there were false alarms earlier in the week, but okay. that was the real deal. <laughs> okay, that makes it all yeah. worthwhile. Um, I also really appreciate that you give me a chance to introduce a talk called Hot Topic. So that's also, <laughs> yeah, really doing it. Um, but yeah, so I'm actually, I'm really excited to have you on and I reached out to you because you study um, where wildfires are distributed across California and kind of how they affect our local wildlife, which is obviously really top of mind for people that live in the state. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of big questions in this space too. Like we are, I think, also going to talk about how those are actually changing wildlife communities and and forest management, what works, what doesn't, kind of for the mega fires. Potentially, yeah, a little bit. <laughs> okay, all right. Yeah. Well, um, if you don't talk about it enough, we'll ask you lots of really hard questions. <laughs> yeah, um, feel free to. <laughs> okay, cool. And did you always? I know you mentioned that, um, just like casually that you had visited the academy as a kid. Did you always want to be a scientist? No, I didn't know that well, this, what I'm doing is it could actually be a career <laughs> actually, <laughs> until I got, got to college. And I think before I had thought about being a chef and like other yeah. things, but um, yeah. no, this was new territory when I got to college and kind of fell in love with it once yeah. I started. Did you fall specifically? Out. Oh yeah. Sorry. Did you fall specifically in love with, with wildfires and, and that, that kind of phenomenon or what was it that got you? Yeah, more so working with wildlife. Um, mm -hmm. and also, I talk about this a little bit later, but thinking about how different forms of global change, like climate change, wildfire, and other kind of new disturbances are affecting wildlife populations. Um, and how to make those, how to best conserve those, make them resilient. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, I can't wait to hear more about it. Thank you so much again for letting me bother you to do this. No. Um, <laughs> and viewers, I will remind you, you can ask questions for Kendall at any time. If you're watching on Facebook, just leave them in comments. And if you're watching on uh, YouTube, just leave them in the chat box. Um, and I'm going to get out of here and give Kendall his slides, and then I'll loop back at the end to ask your questions. So here is that deck. And yeah, Kendall, I'll see you in a bit. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me again. And happy to talk with all of you. Um, so yeah, today I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some of my research up in Northern California, um, looking at how wa wildlife are responding to recent changes in wildfire uh, regimes across the state. Uh, but before I do that, I wanted to jump in and kind of explain a little bit of my journey and background. Um, so I'm originally from the Central Valley in California, um, very suburban, uh, but after graduating from Tracy High, I started undergrad at UC Berkeley. Um, I'm a first gen college student, so I <laughs> didn't have an exact roadmap of what college would be and what I wanted from college, but I quickly got involved in the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology. Um, it's part of UC Berkeley. They have a lot of uh, opportunities for undergrads to get involved in research, and that's really where I had my first research experiences and made some really awesome friends too. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, because of the MVZ, I was able to get involved with a lot of research with uh, and field work with wildlife species. Probably the best part highlight of this was being able to hold so many different animals. Um, and as I said before, just really fell in love with the field and um, have pretty much been pursuing a career in wildlife ecology ever since. Um, so a so couple of these pictures, I got to travel to Chile um, for a little bit and worked with small mammals there, held a whole bunch of amphibians, worked in the desert in New Mexico. Um, and all of these kind of culminated in me um, pursuing a career uh, in wildlife ecology and looking at conservation of wildlife species. I should also say that um, the Biology Scholars Program at UC Berkeley was super influential in me pursuing this career as well, or all of this, these types of research. Um, BSP is a group that's devoted to promoting um, representation in 
sciences, specifically specifically biology for underrepresented, underrepresented minorities. Um, and I wouldn't be where I am now without BSP support. Um, and finally, all of this is kind of culminated in some of the work I'm doing now in Northern California, um, looking at how wildlife are responding to a recent wildfire. Um, and I'll go into a little bit of that now. So I wanted to also talk a little bit about why I decided to go to grad school. Um, after all my experiences like holding all these different kinds of animals and um, working with different types of wildlife, I really came to appreciate um, this topic called community ecology, which is how different wildlife species interact in uh, different ecosystems around the world. Um, so I came to grad school to learn more about wildlife ecology and conservation, especially in the face of uh, global change, like I mentioned before. And this can come in different forms like climate change, habitat degradation, and wildfire, as I'm gonna talk about uh, later in the presentation. Um, and all of these pictures, I should mention, are assorted wildlife species photos from um, Hopland, California, where I do my grad school research primarily. Um, on the left are two just pictures I took on my um, camera myself while I was out in the field. But on the right are different species that we've taken with our camera traps, which are uh, cam which are cameras that take remote are not re remote photos of animals as they pass by the camera, like a, as a motion sensor trigger. Um, and we can use that to look at the distribution of different wildlife species over space and time. Um, what I really love though about community ecology is that, uh, I've mentioned this in other presentations, but it's like a big ensemble movie or book. Um, and those to me are always the best ones, like Avengers or I don't know, any other big movie. Um, where you have all these interacting characters within this ecosystem or movie or whatever you want to call it, um, interacting, having their own significant roles, but also interacting with each other. Um, and a lot of ecological research argues that the distribution of these different interactions is what creates a broader sense of stability or coexistence or resilience amongst these species. Um, and I also want to note that this picture isn't necessarily the full picture. Um, we have to remember that humans play a big role in how these um, interactions take place and how these communities look. Um, and also to note that most of most of the ecosystems around the world are in some way um, influenced by human influence. So my research is looking at how um, these individual species are responding to changes in wildfire ecology um, and how those individual responses go on to affect how species that they interact with um, also are altered by fire regimes changing. So this is a picture of recent wildfire, I think last year up in Napa and Sonoma County. Um, and I want to pose the question, how are wildfire regimes changing in California? Um, but before that, I want to talk first about what a fire regime is. So fire regime is the general patterning of wildfire in a certain um, ecosystem. So this is normally described as like the size of a fire, how frequent fires normally happen in that ecosystem, the severity. Um, severity is normally described as like how much the vegetation changes after a fire. So during a high severity fire, um, a forest, the trees of a forest will be burned down, but in a low severity fire, the fire will burn underneath um, the crown of the trees. Um, and then how uh, that how those different characters, characteristics of the fire interact with different species. And one thing that's really important to note is that California has several different fire regimes uh, within its, within all of its ecosystems. And that's really what that diversity of ecosystems and the diversity of fire regimes is what makes California such a biodiverse state. Um, it has some of the richest biodiversity in the country and it's also a global hotspot of biodiversity. Um, but just last year um, in 2020 or in August, 2020, we have witnessed um, some of the 
consequences of some of these changing fire regimes. Um, in this picture below, you can see fires covering most of the state from head to toe after uh, that, the, that thunderstorm event that occurred in late August, I think. Uh, so although fires played a pivotal role in shaping both people and landscapes in California, um, changes in recent fire regime patterns may be challenging how um, wildlife and people are able to coexist um, with wildfire as, it, as it's happening now. Um, so it's important to note though that uh, indigenous groups in California have re had readily used fire as a tool um, to manage land and resources, especially as a um, stewardship tool to uh, care for the land. And they continue to do that as well. Um, fire management, has been an important ecological part of the ecosystem for millennia, and it's influenced many of the flora and fauna that we find inside of the state. Um, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about why some of those fire regimes are changing. Um, first, firstly, some some of the fire regimes in uh, the state are being affected by um, long-term trends of fire suppression. So as I mentioned before, fire has been common in many regions of the state um, being managed by people for thousands of years. But um, as a result of European colonialism, um, fire has been suppressed from many parts of the state where it once was uh, very frequent or common. And this has led to a build buildup in many uh, fire fuels. Um, and as those fire fuels grow, when fires do happen, it makes the fire even more severe or even larger. Uh, secondly, urban expansion or uh, the movement of people more into wildland spaces has also caused changes in the patternings of fire across um, some of these ecosystems. So there's research that suggests that um, as people move more or more into wildland spaces, and increases the frequency of uh, fires actually uh, igniting. And that can change some of the uh, patterning of some ecosystems where fires may be less frequent than they, um, or they're less, they're more infrequent uh, in the past than they are currently. And then finally, climate change plays uh, another big role in causing prolonged drought and also uh, increasing the frequency of extreme fire weather events, which can create some of these mega fires or extremely large fires that we're witnessing today. Um, and there's been a lot of talk about um, how to best manage some of these changes in wildfire history. Uh, there have been many headlines in the past couple of years that have captured a lot of the destruction and the death that some of these fires have caused. And there have been a lot of um, suggestions on how to best deal with some of these issues, some better than others. Um, but central to some of this discussion is whether or not uh, forest fires are the predominant cause of a lot of this destruction and um, a lot of the consequences that we're seeing from these changes in wildfire regimes. Um, so, so a project my lab and I are currently kind of wrapping up is looking at how the distribution of wildfire um, wildfires has both changed and is uh, continuing to change across the state in the last 20 years. So if you look at this map on the left, this is a map of the state and we've broken down the uh, state into six very broad ecosystem clusters. Um, and the big question here is whether or not uh, conifer forest, uh, which is what most of these discussions are referring to, whether or not that ecosystem type is actually where most fires are occurring. So if you look very closely, we have the burn perimeter of all the fires in the last 20 years outlined across the state. And basically we're taking a cookie cut, cut out of each fire to look at uh, the composition of that fire in terms of ecosystem type. Um, so if we pull all of that data together, I'm gonna walk you through this. Um, these bars show how many hectares or the area of each ecosystem burned in the last 20 years. And although we see conifer did burn upwards of 2 million hectares in the last 20 years, it's actually shrubland 
that burns uh, the most. And then if we look even closer, this graph is showing um, the total, how uh, proportional the land that burned uh, for each e ecosystem is to the land that is available. So in other words, we can say that uh, this blue hardwood and brown shrubland burn uh, disproportionately more than conifer, especially if we look at how, uh, how much conifer there is distributed across the state. Um, and then also, if you look here at 2020, it's very clear that uh, there's a large spike for most uh, ecosystem types in terms of area burned. Um, so the big takeaway message from this is that just managing forest fires um, will not solve all of California's current issues uh, with wildfire and that we need a multi-ecosystem kind of strategy that deals with um, creating tools and strategies that deal with specific re fire regime um, requirements for shrubland, hardwood, grassland, and everywhere, everywhere else that there's fire. So now I wanna talk specifically about some of my research with wildlife in uh, Hopland, California, Northern California and Mendocino County, um, and why I think Hopland has been just an amazing place to do um, research in this kind of field. And I'll note that I'll be talking about the river fire, which uh, started in July, 2018, and was part of the much larger Mendocino complex fire, um, which became at the time the largest wildfire in uh, California's history. Um, before, but first I wanna chat a little bit about Hoplin. Um, so the Hoplin Research and Extension Center is a, a part of UC Ag and Natural Resource Extension. Um, it's located about two hours north of Berkeley and it's off of Highway 101. Um, it's mostly rangeland with a lot of oak woodland habitat. Um, and Hoplin's really cool because it has uh, both sheep rearing and other you know, types of human livelihoods, um, also on the same area as uh, a diversity of different wildlife species, like this black bear pictured here. Um, and I think Hopland's really interesting in that it's a uh, wildland urban interface, and which is basically a way to say how, uh, as I was saying before, how urban expansion is pushing people more towards wildland spaces and a lot of these spaces are overlapping between wildlife and people. Um, and as movies continue to expand across the state, um, as they are now, I think more of the state is gonna resemble Hopland, at least in some ways. And movies are also an important point, again, in that uh, many movies are being studied and how they interact with wildfire ecology and how they may change uh, fire ecology in those areas. Uh, Previously, there's been a lot of work looking at different wildlife distributions across the property. Um, there have been many bio blitzes where people come out to Hopland and uh, uh, chronicle how many different species they see of different taxa. Um, there, there have been many bird surveys and many small mammal uh, surveys as well. So there's a lot of research to pull from um, and look at in the past as I look at how these species are changing into the future in response to fire. Uh, so I'll zoom in and give you a little look or a bigger look of what Hoplin looks like. Um, so this was created by an, elab, an alum, alumni in our lab, Alex McInturf. Um, and it's basically a veg map, vegetation map of all the different habitat types that cover Hoplin. And I think it's really interesting that Hoplin has, so if you look, it has oak woodland, grassland, and then at the top it has chaparral. And in a lot of ways, it's a very diverse set of ecosystem types, similar to how we looked at um, how ecosystem types are distributed across the state. So Hopland contains many different types of fire regimes within it. And sometimes uh, fire ecologists re will refer to that as a mixed regime, uh, sorry, a mixed severity landscape, where you have areas that burn at high severity, like chaparral. Um, so when chaparral burns, it burns completely. It only leads like leaves skeletons. 
versus oak woodland and grassland, which is normally a lower severity fire regime and burns normally the understory of uh, woodland trees. So this makes it a very interesting example to see how wildlife are responding to these mixed, uh, mixed regime landscapes. So back in 2016, the Brashares Lab started a project looking at how um, deer populations were changing in response, or how, how to best estimate deer population uh, numbers. And this was done using a combination of different tools, one of which was, um, as I mentioned before, a grid of camera traps. So in this map, you can see um, the property is divided into hexagonal grids, points, and then at the, each, at the center of each grid point is a camera, which is looking, uh, which is taking data of different animal uh, populations that are within that area. And we can use that to look at the distribution of different species. And then secondly, the Brochera's lab had also started uh, GPS collaring deer within the area to look at how movement and behavior um, is both changing over time, but then also using this in conjunction with our camera grid to estimate deer population. And this was all done in um, conjunction with uh, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, who are very interested in looking at how, or getting a better estimate, estimator of deer population across the state. So this is what the river fire looked like across Hopland. Um, it entered Hopland J July 27th, 2018. And you can see that it burned about half of the property. Um, so if you can imagine, we have cameras outlined across this perimeter um, and about half or a little over half of the cameras burned. Um, I'll, I'll have a better picture later. And just to blow out to see the entire scale of that fire, uh, the Mendocino Complex fire, which I mentioned was the biggest fire at the time, was much, much bigger than Hopland itself. Um, and I, it still kind of blows my mind that just last year, this fire was usurped by an even bigger fire, which was actually not that far, just further up into the Mendocino National Forest. Um, and just to see what it looks like on the ground, this is me, uh, my lab mate Phoebe and other lab mate Amy looking at kind of the moonscape of Hopland about two or three months after the fire. And you can see this is definitely one of the higher severity patches where there's just um, snags left and not much else. And then this is me standing next to what's left of like a fallen tree, probably burned to ash in another high severity area. So I've given you a little introduction of what's happened at Hopland. And now I wanna talk about uh, specifically how different wildlife species are um, responding to that seemingly uh, severe disturbance. So some of the things I think we should keep in mind when we talk about how wildlife are responding to wildfire is um, severity. So severity uh, is, a, again, a measure of how the vegetation changes um, within that landscape. And that can have both direct and indirect effects on wildlife. So repeated large and high severity fires may potentially have negative impacts on wildlife communities. Um, this could be through mortality for some less mobile species, but for some, for, but for many species, this comes indirectly by dramatically changing vegetation. Um, oaks are a huge food resource for many species in this system. Acorns come in periodic crops, um, but provide huge amounts of food for deer, rodents, birds, and all the species that eat those species. So they're a very important base um, in terms of resources for those species. Um, but frequent high severity fires could cause oak mortality and prevent oaks from resprouting or regenerating through um, new acorns. And that could thereby undercut um, resources for species for a long time after the fire. Um, similarly, we don't always know the long-term lag effects of fire and how the changes in these vegetation structures might affect species over longer time periods. Um, and then to me, one of the most interesting things is how um, these 
individual responses of like a jackrabbit or you know deer may go on to affect their other species that they're coexisting with, like mountain lions or coyotes. So we're looking at, um, we're using a couple different tools to look at how different species are uh, distributed following the fire. First and foremost, we have our camera grid, which uh, very luckily was established before the fire in 2016. So we have a lot of data, um, both before and after to compare uh, how mammal community or how the mammal community is changing in response to, to that fire. Um, so the cameras are taking pictures of medium to large size mammals, skunks up to bears normally. Um, we have 36 cameras across the whole property and they're taking pictures year round. Um, we normally check the cameras every three months, which comes out to four times a year. Um, and I think very surprisingly, almost all the cameras survived the fire um, that actually got burned. So 25 cameras were it within the burns perimeter and 11 cameras were outside of the burn, if you remember that map from before. So on top of cameras, we're also looking at how birds are distributed following this fire. Um, so with each camera grid point, we're pairing it with an acoustic monitor, which is recording bird song. Um, so these audio moth units are little handheld recorders that you can program to record audio um, at different times during the day. And we're doing this during uh, the spring season, so March to June. And that's because we want to sample the dawn chorus when birds are singing their characteristic song for their species. And we can use these uh, specific bird songs to identify uh, which species are in the area. So we've, I've programmed these uh, audio moths to take five minute audio snapshots uh, before, during, and after sunrise. Um, so for each camera grid point, we have each audio moth out there for four mornings of sampling at each grid location to get a full sampling. And then secondly, uh, we're also looking at how bats are responding after the fire. And I think the bat question is really interesting because bats depend on echolocation to you know, navigate around their ecosystem. And echolocation relies heavily on how the like the physical structure of the habitat. So if trees were once there and they're not there anymore, echolocation might not be, or it might work differently for depending on which bat species we're talking about. Um, so these are also paired with the grid camera, the, the camera grid points. Um, and we're using, it's called an SM mini bat unit and it records ultrasonic um, instead of just acoustic, which is too high for human ears to hear. Um, but we do the same sampling from March to June during the spring. And instead of mornings, we have them um, sampling at night. So every time a bat passes and uses its call, echolocation call, it triggers the um, ultrasonic recorder to record that into an uh, audio file. And then last summer, we got upwards to 70,000 calls, which I'm trying to clean the data of right now. <laughs> It's taking a while. And this is what the SM mini bats look like. So how, for the cameras, it's pretty um, pretty easy to s sort some of the data, or not easy, but it takes a long time, but you do it by sight. You can tell it's a bear, so you can identify like the picture into what species it is. For bird and bat, it's a little different. Um, for bird classification, you can listen. You could listen by ear to each audio file and identify which species is in the file and write down each species for each camera grid point. Um, there's also a couple of new softwares, including BirdNet, which I'm trying to try, um, which can auto classify the audio file. Basically, it takes the audio file and turns it into a sonogram, which is like a graph of the sound and it uses an algorithm to um, identify that graph into a species. Or you could use citizen science where you find groups of people who probably are much better than I am at identifying bird songs um, and work together to identify those species 
um, and then use that data for analyses. That classification is a little different, but somewhat, somewhat maybe straight, more straightforward. Um, bats, you can't hear the audio because the ultra, ultrasonic um, calls are too high. So instead, uh, you have to use uh, auto classification software such as Sonobat to take those sonograms and uh, classify them into species. So I'm gonna I want to talk a little bit about some initial hypotheses um, been thinking about for the camera trap data, and I'm happy to talk about birds and bats later if anyone has questions. But for the cameras, um, I'm, we're thinking that areas with high burn severity will have uh, comparatively lower detections of certain species compared to areas of low severity, and again, um, this thinking is following the idea that severe, high severity areas may have less cover of vegetation and potentially less forage. Um, and I think this will be particularly important for prey and specialist species or species that depend on uh, specific types of resources, which might be taken away by high severity fire. Um, and secondly, um, through anecdotal kind of evidence and uh, just thinking about how some of the predators hunt, like lions, depending on um, ambush, ambushing prey with cover. Uh, it may be so that some of the larger predators will avoid some of the burned areas um, and use them less often. And there's been some research that um, as larger apex predators leave areas, it can release or make uh, some of the smaller carnivores or predators such as coyotes fox, skunk, and bobcat more, more active or more abundant in those areas. So I'm, I'm going to just show a little bit um, of the data that we're working with. And I, I can walk you through the next couple of graphs. But on the, on the x-axis, sorry, on the y-axis, we have the number of detections that all of the cameras have taken, all of them pulled together, all 36 cameras. And on the x-axis, we have time. So basically this is showing you how many detections of wildlife species we have over time. And this red line is showing when the fire occurred. So there isn't, a from what I can see, not a dramatic change in the number of detections. There might be a small decrease, but I think the biggest trend is there's a, definitely a seasonal pulse in the number of detections um, that centers around the fall and winter. So if we take a closer look, I've split this data up into burned and unburned cameras. So this red line follows how many wildlife detections we see from only the cameras that were within the fire. And this uh, blue line follows how many detections we see of uh, wildlife and cameras that weren't burned. Um, and again, this red line shows when the fire occurred. So we would expect um, just based on the fact that more cameras burned, 25 cameras burned, we probably expect that we'd get more wildlife species in you know, these burned cameras uh, group. But as we can see after the fire, there actually does look like there's a decrease in uh, the number of wildlife species detected in the burned cameras up to the point where right around 2020, uh, burned and unburned cameras have almost equal number of detections. So potentially there is a change, but again, I should say that this is before any of our analyses and this is just looking at kind of the raw data. And there are a lot of things that can affect um, how cameras are able to detect species. Um, but this is a good place to start. This is an even closer look <laughs> of the same data. So on the left, this is uh, the data for only the burned cameras across time. And on the right, this is the data for all the unburned cameras across time. Um, and instead, we've broken down the chart into the different types of species that were detected. So each column is like, I think it's a month, and then the color corresponds to the different species that were detected in that month. Um, and as you can see, for both the burned and unburned, the large majority of the uh, species that we detect are deer. <laughs> um, so in the next graph, I've just taken the deer out so it's a little easier to look at the rest of the species. Um, and the biggest thing I want you to note 
from here is that if you look on this graph, this is the burn, uh, burn cameras across time. And you look at this olive species, which is squirrel, gray squirrel, um, right after the fire happens, there's a immediate drop in squirrel detection numbers, um, which could suggest that you know, either squirrels no longer want to use the burned areas or there was some degree of mortality from the fire. Um, but squirrel, number, so squirrel detection numbers have not come back, at least not by the end of 2020 following the fire. Um, so again, we, we can use these to kind of form hypotheses and uh, kind of aim exactly how we want to do the analysis. And I just wanted to blow, blow up like three different species examples um, to kind of drive this point a little further. Um, these are the deer detection numbers between burned and unburned cameras. So again, we can see it looks like deer detection numbers were already decreasing in the burned areas. But after the fire and by 2020, um, the number of detections in burned and unburned deer or burned and unburned cameras is equal um, in terms of deer detections. And again, we probably would expect that um, burn cameras would have more just because there's more cameras in that burned area. Coyotes have an interesting trend um, if we follow their uh, number of detections over time. So right after the fire, there's a huge spike in the number of coyotes detected. And this could be, it could be for a number of reasons. It could be that coyotes actually do prefer the burned areas um, after the fire, maybe to maybe it's easier to find prey in those areas. Maybe there's some other advantage. Um, also, there could, there's also a possibility that um, after the fire, there's less vegetation in the way of the camera. <laughs> so it might be just easier for the camera to detect coyotes. Um, and these are, the, these are different things that I'm trying to incorporate into our future analysis um, in which we try to see whether or not coyotes are actually selecting for these areas or is it just a function of the camera, how the camera works? And then finally, I wanted to show the squirrel example. Um, lots of squirrels in the burned areas prior to the fire. And then uh, again, we can see this uh, large drop right after the fire, which is not returned back to uh, the previous number of detections that we had seen in years prior. So some of the future work I'm looking at for this is I really, I think Hopland has been a really cool example to leverage pre and post fire camera data where it's very rare to get that opportunity. Um, and I'd love to look at how changes in canopy cover, so like how changes in vegetation cover and cover for different prey and predator species and the burn history of those areas may be affecting the ind individual responses of those species over time. Um, and then potentially, I think with all the other fires that happened last year, it could be a good um, case study to, ex to compare to, or Hopland may be a good case study to compare to some of these other sites. Um, there's many U other UC reserves that burned during July and August last year, and then other many other areas that have burned in the last year that could be good comparative sites as well. Um, so some of the preliminary research, preliminary results we're looking at, at HREC at least, um, it does look like um, some of the apex predators like mountain lions and black bears are using the burned areas a little less often. Um, deer slightly uh, decrease some of their occupancy of those burned areas. Um, coyotes, at least in some of the initial an analyses, are greatly increasing their occupancy in some of those areas. Um, and it's a mix for some of the other miso carnivores. Uh, and these again are just prelim preliminary results, but uh, could suggest some of the hypotheses that we had created initially may be true. So I want to secondly transition into looking uh, explicitly at how deer move across the landscape using our uh, GPS collars to follow their behavior um, and movement. Uh, so why why is this research important? Why is it important to know how the black-tailed deer specifically are responding to this uh, fire? 
one big question I have for the deer is exactly how are they able to adapt and what is their capacity to adapt to Megafire? So as Megafire becomes more common across the state, it's going to be important to know the exact um, ability of different species to respond appropriately or adequately to continue to exist in a lot of those environments. Um, Megafires are much larger than historical wildfires, so they can potentially be challenging um, how and if movement can compensate for some of these disturbances. Um, also, importantly, unlike other black-tailed deer, California black-tailed deer don't migrate, so their movement decisions and behaviors at their current home range basically is, is very predictive of their success and survival. Um, they're not going to move to a whole nother place. Um, and then finally, the movement decisions and behavior following fire um, will impact the habitat usage, movements, and success of their predators, uh, mountain lions. So depending on how black-tailed deer de or decide to use uh, these burned areas, it's also going to influence a lot of the other species that are coexisting with them, including mountain lions. Um, Again, mountain lions are ambush predators and their primary prey are deer. So they, they do require some cover <laughs> to, to uh, be able to catch uh, their prey. Um, so how do we collar um, these deer species at Hoplin? We use uh, deer clover trapping. Um, so this is normally done in the summer or early fall. Um, our collars have a one hour fix rate so it's sending a GPS point once per hour. Um, and collars normally last for one year. So we get a year's worth of movement data um, from each of our deer. And uh, this started in 2017. So we have a lot of pre-fire movement data that we can use to compare to uh, post-fire uh, data. So some of the initial hypotheses we have for some of these uh, deer movement responses are that high severity air areas are likely going to have reduced cover and forage immediately following the fire. And this may also depend on the vegetation type, but I think deer may avoid um, some of these higher severity burn patches um, within their home range. Secondly, uh, because chaparral burns at such high severity and is very exposed, predicted that deer would move more directly or avoid some of those high severity patches to avoid the possibility of encountering predators or, um, and then this thir thirdly, um, there's research that suggests that there's a magnet effect after fire. So in low and medium severity fires, um, a lot of times herbivores will preferentially use those areas because, or following the fire because the fire is able to return a lot of nutrients back to the soil, which come back as highly nutritious um, forage or plant vegetation um, for deer and other herbivores to eat in the following years. So potentially um, deer might choose to use some of the low to medium severity areas one to two years following the fire because of this magnet effect. So this is kind of just a visualization of what uh, some of the data might look like um, for just a handful of deer. I think this is the right before the fire. Um, I had a longer clip that showed like throughout the fire and J3, this green deer moves all over the place to avoid avoid the, uh, the fire. But there are definitely individual responses to how um, different deer respond uh, to the event. So there's already been some work done to look at how deer initially have responded to this specific fire. Um, this project was led by an undergrad in our lab who led this project as an honors thesis, but is now a uh, currently being in, under review and potentially to be published. Um, and it looked specifically at how um, movement has changed for these deer in the first five months following this fire. And one of the big uh, takeaways was that deer temporar temporarily do leave their home ranges to avoid the fire, but they quickly return um, almost within hours or days following the fire. Um, and deer, these deer remain very faithful to their original home range, but the home ranges for most of these deer uh, doubles 
and that deer are more likely to use woodland habitat versus other chaparral or other exposed areas. So in this example, I have this blue um, home range estimation for K1, that's one of our deer. So the blue is the before fire home range estimate and post fire in the five months following, the home range is um, approximately double. And we think that this may have to do with deer expanding their usage of uh, the land and able to compensate for a lack of forage um, at following the fire and using more area to compensate for the resources that um, they aren't able to get or to compensate for all the resources, resources that aren't enough in their original home range. Um, so secondly, I'd like to continue some of this uh, research by looking at how uh, habitat selection for the deer continues to change over time. So this map is, uh, it's a map from the US Forest Service of the soils or fire severity of the river fire on Hopland. And I'm really interested to see if uh, deer movement and habitat selection on this area goes on to have, um, if soil severity goes on to have continued effects on how deer continue to use this area in the next coming years. Um, and then secondly, we can look at fine scale movement decisions. So if you imagine this is just like the track of a deer over time, um, it looks very like squiggly, but you can imagine we could take this track of a deer and put it on top of um, different uh, like habitat types or severity and see whether or not the behavior of those different trajectories changes depending on where the deer is. So we might expect that deer going through high severity areas might take a very direct path through those high burned areas, um, or they might take, uh, spend more time and spend more time like, I don't know, um, walking around in areas that have more forage or more vegetation. Uh, so in addition to deer, I think Hopland also provides a really cool opportunity to potentially collar um, both prey and predator species at the same time so that we can look at um, how these uh, interactions between predator and prey may change in response to uh, wildfire. So initially, we spent quite a <laughs> bit of time in the last year trying to collar mountain lions, but we haven't had much luck. Um, and this may be partially due to the, to the fire, making lions less likely to be in the area. Um, but more recently, we have had luck looking at, uh, or trying to collar coyotes. Um, and I think looking at coyote movement in this area would be, presents a very interesting question. One, because coyotes are uh, more generalist carnivores. Um, so they may be able to do better in some of these burned areas, um, but also, Based on our camera trap data, it looks like coyote, coyotes may even prefer some of the burned areas. Um, so this movement data could help corroborate some of those hypotheses. And yeah, just last week, as I mentioned to Laurel, uh, I was we got our third coyote collared, and that was the first time I'd been able to be involved in that. So it was pretty awesome. <laughs> uh, so. Just to bring all the pieces together, um, again, deer are dominant ungulates in these ecosystems. So they have a profound effect on the structure of the food web um, in this ecosystem and many other oak woodlands. Um, it's difficult to judge what the impacts on oak woodland ecosystems are for some of these big wildfire events. And that's because oaks kind of operate on much larger timescales. Um, Oaks can take like decades to, to mature and reproduce until conditions are just right. So it makes it all the more important to proactively think about um, their conservation, the conservation of oaks and the conservation of those wildlife species that use those spaces. Um, and we don't wanna miss our window. So I'd just like to thank uh, the Prescheras Lab, uh, been an awesome team and we all work together on our various projects to I think makes some really cool science happen. Um, also like to thank Stevens Lab and Militon Labs uh, for all their support. 
And a big, big thank you to the staff at HREC. Um, none of this research would have been possible without Allison and Troy and um, everyone else who makes uh, it all work. And I've also had the opportunity to work, work with some great undergrad students and research assistants in the field and also with cleaning some of the data. And I'd like to thank them and also thank my Nat Geo grant, um, which helps fund a lot of the bat work that I'm currently working on. And I just wanted to leave uh, one final note um, that there's opportunities to support some of the groups that have helped me succeed and helped a lot of other people succeed as well. Um, on the left, there's a link to the Biology Scholars Program Fund. Um, I, yeah, I think uh, it could really use the support right now. Um, they've been super influential to my success and I think um, it'd be a real shame to let that program go. Um, they've helped so many others. So please, if you can um, give to that. And then on the right, um, there's the Black Mimologist BIPOC Scholar Award. So Black Mimologist Week was a group that I was involved with um, last year and we created a fund that helps support um, initial research opportunities for uh, black and indigenous students of color. So please visit our, that's the landing page, but you can find the link to the fund um, attached to that. And thank you and happy to take any questions. Yeah, we have some for you. And, oh, okay. uh, and I wanted to say we dropped um, hyperlinks to both the BSP program and the Black Mammalogist Scholar Award into the comments and chat boxes. So those are clickable awesome. for folks who want them. Thank yeah. You. Um, thank you so much. That was so cool to hear you really kind of unpeel the layers of different um, different fires and different ecosystems. And you know, we hear more and more about this idea that higher levels of biodiversity equals better resilience. But I think your talk really brought home the kind of complexity of the systems in play. So really cool. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the first question, so that is complex. The first question is not complex. It was from <laughs> Ali, age eight, who on your first slide immediately wanted to know what is your favorite animal to hold? Ooh, um, <laughs> actually it was on there. Um, the little guy? The, yeah, the Degu, the little rodent from Chile. They're just, so a lot of small mammals, <laughs> they bite you or try to bite you when you hold them. Fair. But the Degu, yeah, very fair. Degu is a, <laughs> Like most of the ones I held were so like relatively sweet, <laughs> like very content to be held at least uh, when we were holding them. But, and they also have um, little cute like lion tough tails where uh, it's stop. like long and then, yeah, <laughs> definitely Google them. <laughs> okay, we better put a link to those in there too. Um, so, so there's a couple questions from Cassell whose sixth grade class was watching. Um, one student wanted to know, um, can animals evolve so that they become more immune to fire? Mm, that's, a, that's a good question. So I, I don't know if I would say they can evolve to become immune, but a lot of the species um, in California and other places where there's a lot of fire, they have evolved to adjust to um, fire being present. So. Mm -hmm. I guess one example I can have is there's uh, a w some woodpeckers that actually follow fire. So they're actually, when a fire occurs, they've evolved to um, take advantage of the, I think it's like the beetles or bugs that use the remains of the trees. Oh. Um, so yeah, I, I guess I wouldn't say they evolved to survive like the flames. <laughs> right, right. But they are evolving, uh, or at least like co-evolving with these different fire uh, patterns mm -hmm. to best take advantage of uh, whatever uh, is occurring after the fire. Right. So maybe evolve like behaviorally, but not biologically becoming superhero yeah. figures. <laughs> Which would be cool, but. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, and then another student asked, um, after a fire, wouldn't the prey animals lose their food sources and become diminished? Yeah, so um, another point to that project that we I had talked about before with the deer, looking at how deer um, responded in the first five months of the, after the fire, we actually did do, a part of that project was looking at um, body condition of those deer. Um, through with our cameras. And we actually 
can see that body condition for a lot of those deer in the burned areas decreased after the fire. Um, so it, I do think that at least forage quality or quantity following the fire um, did diminish, but it didn't have a, we, as far as we can tell, no, none of the deer within the burned area actually died from, from that event, but it could have long-term effects, longer term effects than just immediate. Um, and then I think that effect is probably intensified if you're a smaller animal, like a squirrel or a like mouse, where your home range is so tiny that if all the vegetation is gone in that area, you won't have anything to eat. Um, and if you can't travel to find more food, then yes, I think numbers or abundance could be uh, diminished. Great. Okay. Good question, Mrs. C, Mrs. C's class. Um, so several people commented that it's really hard to kind of comprehend the size of these fires um, when they see them on your maps. And Jake asked, is there a is is there a specific definition for what makes a mega fire? Yeah, that <laughs> um, so normally when, when I at least when I talk about mega fires, uh, we talk about them as being any fire that's more than a hundred thousand acres. Okay. And I know, yeah, it's hard to visualize that. Um, but I did. I used to have this one figure that showed the Thomas fire, which was a fire in near Santa Barbara from 2017. And if you could imagine, um, the perimeter of that fire covered the entire Bay Area. <laughs> um, yeah. So that's the kind of scale that we were talking about. Um, yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. <laughs> okay. So yeah. Um, Eleanor was curious. Uh, do you work with other regions or nations that use the same methods? I think that's a good question too. Just like, what is the info sharing like in this area? Yeah. Uh, well, one of the, I guess one of the biggest areas that I at least um, look to <laughs> when I'm trying to think about my research is Australia. <laughs> yeah. Um, right. So Australia, yeah. Australia has a very, or at least Southeastern Australia has a very similar, we call it like Mediterranean ecos um, climate ecosystem. Mm. Uh, with like dry summers um, and wet winters. And as like in the beginning of 2020, Australia had that, you know, catastrophic set of wildfires um, just before hours later on in 2020. Um, and they, a lot of research is happening there looking at how best to um, recoup or like reseed some of the areas that have lost a lot of vegetation or other ways we can manage those areas to you know bounce bounce back but right. i haven't i haven't um yeah i haven't started like a explicit like project with anyone from there yet um but there's definitely potential i mean i think yeah these changing fire regimes aren't or these changes in fire ecology aren't just happening in California, it's happening right. in other parts around the world as well. Um, so there's definitely, yeah, space to come together collaboratively yeah. <laughs> to think about how best to respond. Right, okay, great. Um, this one is from Susie. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about how you use citizen science or community science in your research? Does going to BioBlitzes help? Yeah, I, well, I would say, I think having bio blitzes, at least in the past, to look at, <laughs> to kind of inform some of my research is super important. Mm -hmm. um, and then saying that, I think having bio blitzes, you know, across time anywhere <laughs> um, is super relevant and super important. I think as we look at how global change is um, affecting different wildlife populations over time, having snapshot, I like to call them snapshots, but like yeah. an idea of how the communities look like at different points in time um, is critical for us to like know exactly how they've changed. Um, and for the citizen science piece, I haven't, I haven't been able to start that yet, mostly because I've, uh, I've mostly been working with the camera trap data, which we uh, clean and sort ourselves. But right. I think that's an, important next step for especially the bird data um, where there are, there are just so many great birders, <laughs> um, right. especially in, in our area um, that could help identify some of these species. But yeah, I think it could be something that could be set up online or yeah, some kind of like web service that you can like download 
one clip from one cam one camera site, listen to it, and then write down the species that you mm -hmm. hear and then re-upload that. Um, yeah. yeah, definitely possible. And I think it'd be it just help immensely <laughs> yeah. and take care of some of this data. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, let's see. I'll I'll hit you with we'll just we'll take three more here. Um, Melanie was curious, she heard you reference long-term lag effects on populations and wondered if you could explain um, what that means. Yeah, so when I say long-term lag, lag effect, I just mean that it's an effect that isn't um, immediate. So mm -hmm. for the deer example, um, a lot of the movement responses that uh, that first project was looking at is only looking at the first five months. So how do deer move like literally in the burned area um, and survive in that like burned landscape? But a lot of the, the effects of really high severity fires in some of these areas are going to have effects years um, from the initial fire event. Um, so I think in that case, I was talking about um, acorns and oaks. Mm -hmm. So acorns are like the primary food resource for like all, the, like so many species in these areas. And if if a lot of those oaks uh, disappear or die because of the fire, a lot of those acorn resources are just gonna disappear. Right. But uh, we wouldn't see the effect of that immediately. It would take until those oaks die and those acorns to disappear for us to actually see it. Um, so that's also why it's important to continue, continually look at um, monitoring different species over time, like having cameras up all the time for like several years across um, both the short-term effects and the long-term effects really lets us um, yeah, tease apart some of the different responses to some of these different um, disturbances. Right. Okay. Yeah. You have to keep sciencing. You can't stop at any time. Yeah. <laughs> <Can't stop now. laughs> um, so I wanted to ask this, uh, in, in some of our earlier emails, when we were talking about this show, you mentioned um, that California, because California wildfires occur outside of conifer forests, that's why forest management alone can't address the um, threat of megafire. And that made me realize I don't really understand what forest management kind of targets now. So does it exclusively target conifer forests or how does that work? I think a lot of the po policy and um, management strategies for or from forest management are targeted towards conifer forests, but can are often or sometimes applied to other ecosystems as well. Mm -hmm. um, and there's been research to say that that doesn't always work well uh -huh. um and yeah i in that in my initial um you know discussion about some of that we have like just these six very broad categories but there's a lot of like diversity within those six categories as well um but you know some typical forest management might be like you know thinning trees um prescribed burning which is like really important for forests mm -hmm. and, and to inter reintroduce um wildfires so that we don't have, you know, just infrequent huge fires. We have right. like frequent smaller fires that are right. <laughs> more under control. Um, but if we, I think one of the, an important message that the research tells us and that I want to say is that we can't take those same strategies and apply them to like chaparral. Um, chaparral, like it's supposed to burn infrequently. And if you burn it too often, like if you do prescribed burns, it actually converts the ecosystem um, normally into like grassland by exhausting some of the chaparral species. Um, yeah, so, and there, I think more work needs to be done on identifying some of the potential strategies we can use for some of these non-forest ecosystems. And there, there has been a lot of work looking at that, but um, yeah, I think we need a multi- <laughs> Right, a, a multi-tool toolkit <laughs> right. in order to deal with all all the different types of fire problems. Right, and we need a really in-depth understanding of what each ecosystem's kind of unique needs and right. responses are, which is what what you and your colleagues are working on. That's so cool. Um, well, I'll end with this last question from Pete, which is uh, I think a, maybe a hard one, um, but 
something that we always get asked a lot whenever we have a scientist on talking about um, anything really is is basically just how people can help. So Pete's specific Pete's question is, is there anything individuals in California can do or should be doing to advocate for different or better forest management? Yeah, I, um, well, for forest management. Or just, I think generally, how can people help? Is there, is, is you know, is there a way? And I do, I know that's tough, but, um, you know, whether it's going to BioBlitzes and contributing data or yeah. advocating for specific policies, I think whatever you can point people to would be great. Yeah, I will, I think, the two things you just suggested are good oh, points. Hey, as well, okay. but, <laughs> um, yeah, I think um, specifically, like depending on where you live, learning about your local fire regime is probably mm -hmm. really important. Like if you're if you're in one of these wooey areas um, where you know fire uh, may be happening more frequent, or you you may you know be more exposed to wildfire, like there isn't as much of a hard urban boundary. I think it's important to be cognizant of that and work with, you know, at the community level to ensure that um, even before the fire, like your community is ready. Um, right. There, at least in Sonoma County, I think there's like a really cool group of co-managing like fire managers who work together to do prescribed burns and um, support each other for, you know, both pre and post wildfire. Um, so it's important to know where you are and yeah. um, like what kind of management strategies are required to, um, you know, maintain that kind of ecosystem. And yeah, I also think getting involved in local bio blitzes or other ways to like learn about the species that you're coexisting, cohabitating with, um, I think that's also important. Um, I think we need to get more invested in, you know, the areas that we live in and totally. um, really learn to be stewards of the land and not, you know, just pretend that we are um, living two separate, you know, lives between right. nature and us. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. Now I'm going to steal on that for the next <laughs> two, three days. It was a good answer. And I love, and I was a great way to, to end this idea that we're not, yeah, we're not separate from the places we live. And the, and the more we embrace that, the kind of healthier both will be. That's great. Um, well, I mean, this was, this was awesome. I have to also have to say, I'm, I'm very pleased because I'm going to look for ways to use the phrase squirrel occurrence numbers in conversation from now on, because that was too good. Yeah. <laughs> and honestly, um, like you're, I would love to hear. Oh, did I break up or did? Oh. You still there? <laughs> I think Laurel froze. <laughs> oh. I think I'm supposed to tell a joke, but I don't have any bad jokes off the top of my head. <laughs> oh. Hmm. Well, thank you all for coming. I don't know what Laura was gonna say. Oh, okay. Am I here? Hi. Yes. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Um, okay, I'll get out of here quickly. Kendall, thank you for covering. Did you hit the dad jokes while I was going? I didn't have one ready, I'm sorry. <laughs> Worst I really should have prepared one. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, well, well, thank you. I'll get out of here before that happens. If and, but Kendall, so appreciate you coming on. And um, viewers, I'll say quickly. Uh-oh. Oh, okay. Am I here? Yes. Okay. Well, let's just say bye. Bye. Okay. bye. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you me. all viewers. Take care.